Dean Rutherford, I'm very impressed with the school. It's my first opportunity to be here, and I hope that there will be another. Um, I, I want to get to my take on the elections that are coming up in 2010. Skip wanted me to talk about that, uh, and I'll certainly do that and certainly take questions along that line. But I first wanted to talk a little bit about what I think is and should be uh, the issue in the coming election, not just this one, but uh, several hereafter. In fact, I think it's what will be uh, the dispositive issue from here on out. Uh, start this way because uh, this is a school and there are young people, uh, and I, I'm, I want to say this about them. Tom Brokaw wrote a book, and many of you probably read it, about the greatest generation. And he talked about all those men and women who made it through the Great Depression, hard times that they faced, talked about how they went off to war in World War II and defeated Nazism and uh, defeated the, the Japanese Empire. Uh, one came home and in the post-war era uh, set about to make the uh, greatest uh, post-war economic boom the world has ever seen. Pretty great generation, uh, but also a great generation was the, the founders. 1776, who gave up their lives, their fortunes, put it all on the line uh, to construct and start the greatest nation the world's ever known. I got a little Walter Mitty in me, maybe some of you do too. I like to think uh, and dream about being part of something great like that. Uh, what, a, what an honor it would be to have been part of either of those great uh, ventures, but that sort of begs the question, uh, will there be another, a next great generation? And much has been written about this new generation, the ones that are just coming online right now. They've been called the millennials. I kind of like that name. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that they are technologically superior. I know they are to a bunch of you. Uh, <laughs> that they have uh, a positive attitudes, they really do. They're upbeat, they're not downbeat, uh, as we remember from uh, the 60s. They're more, more affluent, they're better educated, uh, they're more diverse. And so they start, uh, they start with more tools than those of the greatest generation started with. And they start, uh, I think, uh, however, in a place that is every bit as challenging. When I went to Congress 30 years ago, I'm still mad that the Arkansas Democrat is an afternoon newspaper in those days, that I had won that election and I was so proud of myself and damn if I didn't wake up and on the front page of the newspaper, not my picture for winning, but a picture of a tombstone of some guy in Mount Holly Cemetery <laughs> who, had, who had won 104 years ago. I thought that was the dirtiest trick that the media ever played on me. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I, you know, like most of you, I was busy uh, raising a family in Searcy, minding my own business, and lo and behold, I got elected to Congress, and uh, so I, I started reading and studying a lot because I felt like I needed to really get up to speed, and I happened across two books, very interesting to me. I, I remember to this day virtually every word and every book. One of them was written by Bill Simon, who had been the Treasury Secretary uh, for a number of years uh, in the Nixon era and in the Ford era. And he wrote a book called A Time for Truth. And that came out uh, in late 1970. And at the same time, a man named Michael Harrington, who was a noted socialist, the leading socialist uh, in this country at that time, wrote a book. And it was called The Twilight of Capitalism. And the funny thing about the books is, is that they were in agreement uh, on most everything that they had to say in those books, except, of course, the outcome. Simon said, that yes, we're in a heck of a mess, and yes, we're sliding inevitably toward a socialist world, uh, but we've still got some time, but we need to do some things. We need to make some hard decisions, and we can pull back and get out of this and go on to greatness uh, as a capitalist nation. Harrington, on the other hand, said it's game, set, match. It's all over. The country is already a socialist country. It just doesn't know it yet. And the only issue to be resolved is whether it will be a totalitarian socialism, an authoritative uh, socialism, or a democratic socialism. 
So there we were in 1978, that's uh, roughly 30 years ago when I was sworn in. And since then, uh, we had eight pretty good years with Reagan as president and the Democrats controlling Congress. We had eight pretty good years with President Clinton uh, in the White House and the Republicans controlling Congress. President Clinton had the good wisdom to uh, go with the DLC idea, the Democrat leadership Congress, which was sort of a blue dog uh, idea, and uh, worked with the Republican Congress, declared that the era of big government is over, and was willing to reach out and, uh, and, and make the government work. And so those two administrations, I think, uh, were, were pretty good from the time that I got there till now. Uh, but overall, and sadly, I have to say, both Democrats and Republicans have sort of pushed the real problems down the road uh, instead of dealing with them uh, as they should. And, and, and also, unfortunately, is that the American people have let them get away with it. Uh, so today, interestingly, uh, after thinking about those two books back there, there's more talk today about whether we should do capitalism or whether we should do socialism than I've ever heard. I mean, it's uh, openly discussed, uh, and I've just, it's just amazing to me how much that's uh, talked about these days. Of course, the big philosophical question involved in that is that if you're uh, talking about capitalism, you're talking about maximum economic freedom, a reliance on the private sector uh, to create and generate uh, jobs and growth uh, in our economy. And if you're talking, on the other hand, about a socialist economy, you're talking about fewer economic freedoms, more of a planned economy from the top down, uh, and much, much more reliance on the uh, public sector. And so the big issue is which of those uh, is the right way for us to uh, sustain ourselves, to promote growth, uh, and to get our house in order. The stakes are really high, because uh, this is true for nations, and it's true for individuals. If you lose your economic freedom, you will lose your political freedom. That's true for us as individuals, it's true for nations. Zach Carabell, a, a very interesting writer who knows an awful lot about China, uh, recently gave an example of a nation that lost its economic freedom and then lost its political freedom in a sense and uh, was on the decline and lost its place in the, in the world priorities. Uh, it's just one example, there are several. But this is a good one, because we're all familiar with it. Many in this audience are old enough to remember most of this. In World War II, uh, the British Empire had just come out of World War I in a great battle with the Germans. Uh, and, and then they had to get ready for World War II because they could hear those uh, war drums beating again. And so that fear of uh, Germany caused them to run up a huge debt uh, and throughout those war years, even though they were having this great debt, the U.S. would loan them money to help them along, and we had always loaned it to them, zero interest, so that they could get through those hard times and, and keep themselves righted. Uh, then, uh, after the war in 1946, uh, the great, the great Britain came to the U.S. and said, uh, we're in trouble, uh, we've got this huge debt, and uh, we're likely to default. Uh, can we borrow $5 billion from you at 0% interest like we always have? And to their great surprise, the U.S. said, no, uh, we can't do that anymore. Uh, so the U.S. said, uh, tell you what, we'll loan you $3.7 billion at 2% interest. And they had other conditions. And Britain was not accustomed to this. The other conditions were uh, the pound sterling is not going to be the reference point for global exchange anymore. It's going to be the dollar. Uh, that was one of our conditions. There were some other conditions which caused uh, the British Empire basically to fold their tent in India and some other places because we demanded that they stop with the imperialist uh, uh, idea. That was 50 years ago. And essentially that was the end of the British Empire as they had known it for so long. Uh, 
Okay, so everybody says, 50 years ago, come on, you know, that's, uh, what's that got to do with today? So give me a current example, people might say. Okay, here's a current example. A few years back, we were, Atlanta and I went to China just as they were emerging from uh, the communist side. We were one of the first congressional delegations to go in there. And we started urging the Chinese, you ought to move to free enterprise. That's the best way to bring people out of poverty. Uh, you know, start growing, get things going. Uh, so the Chinese, you know, they are uh, smart enough to do that. They move toward free enterprise. And today, this country is growing, you know, depends on whether you're talking to Republicans or Democrats, but it, this country is not growing real good. I mean, like one eight if you're talking to Republicans and maybe two and a half if you're talking to Democrats a year growth rate. Chinese, 10% a year. They are growing and they're lifting people out of policy, uh, poverty. And then people are saying that in 20 years, the Chinese will be the most powerful economic country in the world. And interestingly enough, and this sort of comes back to that Britain example, China now holds 13% of our debt, and our debt is enormous. And once again, it depends on the exact size, depends on whether you're talking to a Republican or Democrat, but the debt is enormous, and they hold 13% of it. Last month, they're, they're our banker when you get right down to it. Last month, uh, the President of the United States went to China, and he was lectured by the Chinese, communist Chinese government. He was lectured by the Chinese about our spending and our profligate ways in America and how we could not afford to do something like health care. That's pretty rough to have the Chinese, even though they are your banker, from where they've been to tell you something like that. And guess what else they're saying? You know what? It might be a good idea to switch away from the dollar as the reference point for a global currency, go to something else, the yuan or the yen or who knows or you know whatever. But uh, that is a current example. That sounds a little bit like me that we might be becoming like Britain. Uh, I think any fair analysis says that we're we're up against it. We've we you know we've got some serious issues to deal with in this country and. We don't have a whole lot of time. Bill Simon said time for truth, and it's been 30 years since he wrote that book. And uh, we've used up those 30 years, and, and we haven't exactly taken his advice. We need a credible plan. We need to restore uh, budget balancing sometime within the next five or 10 years. That's our window. And now don't misunderstand me, and if there's anybody here writing for the press, I'm, the debt is large, but it is manageable. This is not a gloom and doom story. This is a story of opportunity. And, you know, we've had other ups and downs in this country. There's been a lot of talk about the Great Depression and all of that. Uh, and, but let me just say that we've had these other ups and downs, and this recession is more like the recession we had in 72, 73 than it is uh, anywhere like uh, the Great Depression. If anybody, and most of the people in this audience don't need this, but there are a lot of people that maybe don't know about the Great Depression. Well, go ask Tom Jode, and uh, if, you, if you don't remember Tom Jode, go get uh, John Steinbeck's book, The uh, Grapes of Wrath, and read about the Jode family, and then you'll understand what they went through uh, in the Great Depression. And, uh, and by the way, uh, back in those days, there wasn't any safety nets like we have now with all of our uh, various programs to help people who are in trouble. Back then, the safety net back then was the soup line. So here we are. There are a number of issues that we hear about on a daily basis. You hear about homeland security, you hear about cap and trade energy, you hear about environment, uh, you hear about health care, you hear about transportation, uh, all these various issues that are being propounded uh, by, the, by the political leaders. Um, I say this. When you hear them talking about those issues, there are three questions that you must ask the proponent of those uh, issues and those policies. If they, so, question number one. Will the policy that you urge upon us promote growth and reduce debt? 
That's question number one. Question number two for the person that's telling you what we need to do. Will the policy that you urge upon us promote growth and reduce the debt? And question number three, I can see you already have guessed it. Will the policy you urge upon us promote growth and reduce debt? If it won't, don't do it. And we need to focus like a laser on those three questions. Everything else is a sideshow. Whether President Obama bowed or didn't bow, whether the Chamber of Commerce is evil or not evil, whether he should speak to school kids or not speak to school kids, whether he's a narcissist or not a narcissist, whether he should have sided with the police instead of Professor Gates, uh, whether Bush caused H1N1 and all other bad things in the world. All this stuff is a sideshow. Sideshow. And we need to reject all of the ad hominem attacks that are made in the political arena and you need to hold people accountable and tell them to get the ugliness out of the business. You need to insist, and I mean insist, on a civil discourse on how to solve the problems of guess what? How to restore growth and keep that debt down how to restore growth, and how to keep the debt down. Talk all you want to, Congressman, but in the end, or Senator, or whatever, but in the end, that's what I'm going to ask you when you get through with all your uh, high-powered uh, rhetoric. Now, as we wrestle with these issues, I think it's a good idea to let the founders whisper in our ear a little bit. We need to read what they wrote, we need to study what they did, and we need to understand what they believed. I've been channeling some lately. Uh, Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, you ought to try it sometime. George Proctor, I mean, George, George, George McLeod, the channeler, he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so I've asked them, say, uh, George and Tom and Ben, uh, some people in the USA today are saying uh, we ought to move on to socialism or something like that. What do you think? And they say to me, we didn't set it up that way. You know, we set it up to be a limited form of government where there was maximum freedom for people to engage in free enterprise and thus have a growth and fairness for everyone. That's what we envision. That's what, that's what we hope for. And I think they'd also say that, you know, we set that constitution up so that it would be real hard to change it. And so you're stuck with the Constitution, which limits government and makes it very hard for government to function quickly. Government functions ponderously. It's very slow uh, to act. And so here we are with a Constitution which will not accommodate a top-heavy sort of management hierarchy, if you will, that you would need if you were going to run a full-fledged socialist government. It just, it just won't accommodate it. I mean, they can do that in France or Sweden or wherever. They got parliamentary forms of government. But you need, it's so hard to do anything governmentally in this country because we were designed to just let the private sector function to the extent that it can. And so that's my personal take on it. But guess what? It's the younger crowd and you all out there who are going to get to decide the issue. Uh, and it's coming up in 2010. Uh, this is a crossroads. You know, every politician, every election, I've done this myself. Boy, this election is the crossroads. This is it. This is the big one. And you know, I was, I was guilty of spreading BS and so are the rest of them. Uh, but I gotta, I gotta, I gotta say, I kinda think, we are getting to a crossroads this time. I mean, uh, I, I, think it's, I, think, I think the stakes are getting a little higher than they have been, and I think that the good part about it is is that younger generation, I think they are, and their stakes, the stakes are for them are the highest. All right? A lot of us here, we're going to march off the screen pretty soon. But 
uh, the younger generation, they've, they've got, they're saddled with this. And so uh, it's, really, it's really a tough thing for them. But uh, in, in this particular election, and there's one other thing I want to say before we, we get to some questions. In this election and in every one uh, hereafter, we don't have the luxury anymore of picking congressmen and senators because they've got a really great wife. That's how I got elected. <laughs> or because they've got a really great personality. That's how David Pryor used to get elected. <laughs> or because they answer the mail, or because they return your phone calls, or because they're accessible, or because, uh, hey, he got my uncle his veteran's check, uh, that kind of thing. That is not the criteria upon which to make your political decision uh, now and as we go forward. The criteria is this, and guess what it is? Will you, when you get to Congress, vote for and promote policies that will promote real growth and jobs for all our people? And will you work as hard as you can to keep the debt down and get it retired so that we can maintain our place in the world? So I say to those millennials, Godspeed. I say that to you older guys, too. Thanks. Congressman, we've got some time for some questions, so uh, it's your shot. Come on, let's hear them. Did he just stun you so much that nobody's going to talk? <laughs> Pretty simple. Pretty simple. Yeah, we have one. Ed, what's your assessment of this uh, Medicare or health controversy we're going through with this legislation? Um, you know, I, I said in here, if it, if it won't do those things I said, get, promote growth and, and uh, reduce the debt, that you shouldn't do it. And I, I have to put uh, the big health care debate in that category. Uh, maybe there will come a time, maybe there should have been a time in the past, but it ain't now. Uh, we're in a hell of a mess. So the the thing that troubles me about it is I don't think the numbers work out because there's, they're basically saying it'd be like, uh, okay, uh, I want you to uh, buy this house and you're going to pay me payments on it for three years, but I'm not going to let you move in for four till the fourth year. And so you can make your budget numbers look kind of good if you do that, and that's basically what the proposals that they're pushing forward now do. That's how they're doing it. Plus, they're also saying we're going to take $500 billion out of Medicare. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of money that can be saved in Medicare. It doesn't run right because the government's running it. But uh, it, 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 you're not going to get $500 billion out of there. The numbers don't work. They just don't work. That's my opinion. Yes, sir. Right there. Uh, well, who in Washington is saying now what you propose we should say? There, I have three names for you. John Thune, senator from South Dakota, who a few years back beat Tom Daschle. Uh, second name is John Thune. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. He's a, a, a chowder and marching colleague. And the third name is John Thune, who uh, is in his 40s. Uh, he's a dynamic uh, upbeat, positive young man, uh, a conservative, but not a wild-eyed, uh, crazy conservative. People like him. Uh, I think he'd be a powerful candidate. For women. <laughs> he was voted, uh, he, they have a vote in the magazines in Washington on Capitol Hill. You know, who's the best looking congressman? Who's the hunk? Uh, he always gets it. Uh, hey, Ed, how is yeah, going into Afghanistan with this uh, latest uh, troop increase? How does that answer your question? Let me say that there's one wild card to what I had to say, and I didn't mention it in my remarks because it is a wild card, and the wild card is terrorism. Uh, we're going to have to live with it. We're going to have to deal with it. It's not going to go away. I don't care, you know, whether it's Iraq or whether it's Afghanistan, but we've got to deal with it. 
Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, Lana doesn't like this. I'm old school. You know, I was in the Marine Corps when I was 18, worrying about whether the North Koreans and the Chinese were going to come back and restart that war. I was over there for 16 months. I was in the FBI. I was in the prosecuting attorney and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and I just believe there are some really evil people in the world. Some of them are criminals, some of them are terrorists, and some of them are enemy combatants. Uh, and my way of dealing with them is you know, pretty rough. Uh, you know, and, uh, I cut them no slack. Uh, but that's my take on it. Now, Afghanistan, President Obama is President of the United States. He's Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. I believe, as I have always believed, that when it comes to international and foreign policy, uh, partisanship stops at the water's edge. And I support President Obama. I have nothing negative to say about what he uh, offered yesterday publicly and will not say anything negative about it. Uh, I support him, and I'll support him as long as he needs my support. It's a very tough uh, mission, and uh, in spite of my background as a Marine and uh, whatnot, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's my take on it, Jim. And the expense of it is just something we have to bear. But it's not like the expense of World War II or something like that, which we managed to get through before. But of course, in World War II, you know, we didn't have India and uh, China and Japan and all these big competitors. We came out of World War II, we had an open field. A little different situation. Got a question right here. Let me say first, uh, Ed, it's refreshing to have you up here in front of us. I don't know where I've been and I don't know where you've been, but I haven't seen you talk in a while and I appreciate you coming today. Thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, what are your personal plans? My personal plans? Do you, do you have uh, a, I am not going on the agenda? Huh? Something on your agenda that we might like to know about? Oh, yes. I am not going to try to sail across the Atlantic again <laughs> in a 31-foot boat. Uh, I, have, uh, I have eight granddaughters, uh, all of whom live in the Washington, D.C. area. Our son, Sam, married Allison Anthony, Burl Anthony's daughter, and they have two wonderful children. Uh, they, he's in Norfolk, Virginia. He's career Navy. And so we're going to stay as close as we can to them. And I like to surface every once in a while and put my two cents worth in, which is what I'm doing today. And then I like to go under surface again and mind my own business and enjoy life. Yes, sir, we got a question right here. Can we wait for the mic here, please? I had the privilege of voting for you 30 years ago, and I'm proud and happy that I did. Since then, the party that you represent has not represented my interests, and I often joke that they're allied with the American Taliban. Is, is there any hope that your party will join back and, and try and promote the things you're asking for. I don't hear it, don't see it, and don't believe it at this point. That there are three big you're, hopes. You're different. I sure like you. I wish you'd come back. <laughs> nice. But see, I don't have anything at stake. I'm not running for anything. That makes it easier. Uh, that be said that he's announced his candidacy today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, have, I have three... three uh, Three solutions for that. One is John Thune, two is John Thune, and three. I'm, I'm being facetious. Uh, the party needs to get its act together. And you either stand for something or you don't stand for something. Uh, when I was in Congress, I always, uh, people are amazed by this. There used to be a guy in Congress named Ron Dellums from Oakland, uh, California. He was a member of the American Socialist Party. I really liked Ron. He liked me. We had a great relationship. Uh, didn't agree on a single thing. Uh, but we had a great relationship. You know why I liked about him? I knew where he stood. And you know what Ron liked about me? He knew where I stood. And we weren't going to budge. And the problem, I think, with the parties today is that they're trying to please, you know, people from the other party or whatever. I don't know what they're trying to do, but it ain't working, at least for the Republicans. And I see Doyle is here. Take note, sir, chairman of the Republican Party. I've got a question I want to ask you. The people in your class, 
the three of them or three of the two in your class, and I don't know whether it was in your class, but you worked with him. All three are mentioned as potential candidates. Uh, Cheney, Gingrich, and DeLay. Would you just briefly assess their chances and then besides John Thune, who we're all going to go study about right now. Okay. Who, who else uh, do you see out there? In order, those three, as you mentioned, uh, as you named yeah. them, zero chance, zero chance, and zero okay. chance. Okay. All right. All right. Now that we've... Uh, now that we've zeroed Cheney, Gingrich, and uh, in delay, what about Mike Huckabee? Mike's a great guy, and uh, you know I wish him the best. Uh, but I'm a John Thune man. <laughs> <clears throat> Students who are here, your assignment this afternoon is go research <laughs> John Thune. I just did a survey of our students, Congressman, that that I. On, on the current events and I'm going to release later today or tomorrow and I listed the potential Republican presidential candidates and much to my chagrin into their faces John Thune was not on that list <laughs> but as of tomorrow he will be <laughs> well let me say when you send that around uh, you might start with a uh, really kind of interesting um, column that was written in the New York Times by David Brooks, who poses as a Republican. He's really a liberal. But uh, anyway, he never says anything good about the Republicans, but he had the most glowing column about John Thune that I've read in a long time. And I agree with it. He wrote, every, he wrote everything I told him to write. Like I said, I'm gonna study the guy. <laughs> I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna go research him. Any other questions? Yes, right. What do you think about Sarah Pollock, Pilot? I, she's the most interesting person that's popped up on a, a political screen in a long time. Uh, she f gets people breathing hard faster than anybody <laughs> that I've ever seen in politics. Some of them are mad as hell, and some of them just, you know, ecstatic with joy when they see her. It's, it's incredible. And... Uh, but uh, as far as her candidacy for the president, I'm a John Thune man. Do we have another question? Would anybody like to hear more about John Thune? <laughs> <laughs> the, Lana has Buzz, a question. Buzz, Buzz has got a question. She's one of those that breathes hard, you know. You know so. <laughs> Buzz Arnold. Buzz, good to see you. Wait, we, got, we got a question here. Let's, uh, we got one right here. Oh, first. I'm sorry. Larry, Larry Crane. Okay. Well, um, I just wanted to reflect back whenever 40 years ago we were playing golf and how much I enjoyed playing with you because you always were a straight shooter and, and obviously you've... Not uh, golf, but just straight <laughs> right. and talk, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what, what you've said today... Uh, really, I, I guess I believe in is pretty straightforward and, and seems rather simple, but I'm going to ask you a, a kind of a question here. Uh, what would you do to promote go growth, and how would you reduce the debt? Yeah. First of all, there's, there's th some things don't to do, not to do, and one is don't pass any new entitlements. This is not a good time. Maybe someday, but not now. It's not a good time. That's the first thing to do. Hold the line on spending. It's hard to do. Uh, I can still show you scars I got from voting to cut f funding for REA. Huh, try that one. Uh, so, I mean, I, I remember the day I came out and said I wanted to vote cut spending for REA because I thought the subsidies they were getting were too great. Bill Alexander took the floor and said, Ed Bethune wants to turn out the lights in rural Arkansas. <laughs> and man, I carried that all the way through my campaigns after that. It hurt, but um, anyway. They've got to have the courage to make some cuts where cuts are needed. The only thing I can think of that's been shut down, really, is the old CCC from uh, the FDR days. Uh, that was a damn good program. My dad used to be involved in that, and uh, I used to go to those camps, and I thought it was a great program. Damn if they didn't close it down. Uh, 
but that's because they needed the boys in World War II to be soldiers, so they moved out of there. You got there some, a lot of things that, that could be closed down, shouldn't have ever been done. That's it, spending, but look, you cannot uh, get out of the problem that we face by cutting spending. You've got to hold it, you've got to work a lot harder at it than has been done, but we have got to promote growth. And the classic way to promote growth in this country is to get the regulatory and tax burden off the people who do create wealth. Government doesn't create wealth, people create wealth. And until you release them and release that energy so that they can work and produce and save and invest, you're not going to get there. And so that means tax cuts like we did in the Reagan years. You might target them to people who are really going to hire somebody like old Larry Crane there, you know, small businessman, middle-sized businessman. You're going to hire people. Anyway, that's my take on it. Judge Arnold, for our final question. Don't ask it in Latin. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe I'd practice my Greek a little bit on you. Uh, <laughs> What, what are the, it's great seeing you again, Ed. We're glad you and Lana are back here. Thanks, Buzz. Um, what are the chances that uh, the congressional elections in 2010 will be like the ones in 1994 and uh, witness a Republican comeback? Or 1978, uh, because uh, it's an off-year election. Uh, President Clinton uh, and the Democrats discovered that if you know things are going sour and the public uh, sours on you, that you can lose a lot of House seats in an off-year election and, uh, and, and, and frequently a lot of Senate seats. Uh, 1978, uh, I ran in an off-year uh, for Congress and you know became the first Republican congressman in this district. But I, I must say, because you have a race coming up in this district uh, going forward here, uh, that there were some unique circumstances about my race that are not well remembered. Uh, number one, the Democrats had a tough primary. Doug Brandon emerged as the nominee. Uh, uh, meanwhile, I was just sort of running along, you know, raising money and doing my thing. Uh, but the unique circumstance in that race, the African-American vote in uh, the second district is very important, and it's particularly important in Pulaski County. And uh, many of you may Remember, I started life, like a lot of you did, as Democrat, and I only became a Republican when I wanted to get Orville Faubus out of office. I wanted to get rid of Orville Faubus. I was embarrassed by the uh, Little Rock uh, integration uh, crisis and scandals of uh, 1957, and I wanted Orville Faubus gone. And the only way, and I was just coming out of the FBI at the time, uh, excuse me, yeah, out of the FBI at the time, and I was, uh, and so the only game in town was win Rockefeller who was a moderate Republican from up east and uh, Big Daddy Two Boots, Jim Johnson used to call him. Uh, but uh, Rockefeller was the only game in town. And so I lined up there on the idea that we need competition in politics. You, you know, two parties is a good thing. And so I lined up on the Rockefeller side. And then uh, after I got there, I, uh, I started working my job uh, with the Rockefeller people was to go around the state filing lawsuits uh, to try to make sure that in those days, I, I don't mean this in a partisan way, but the Democrats were the party in those days who were trying to keep the uh, African Americans away from the polling place. And so there were many places, because they were all going to vote for Rockefeller, not Faubus. And so there were many places in this state, your brother Richard Arnold was involved in that deeply, there were many places in this state where uh, the Democrats controlled the county committee and they would set it up so that there would be maybe one judge and one clerk and one or two polling places in, the, in a particular precinct to accommodate six, seven hundred African-American voters. Well, of course, the line stretched from here all the way down to, you know, Markham and Maine uh, for people trying to get in to vote. And so my job was to go around and file lawsuits and get what we call writ of mandamus to force the uh, Democrat County Committee to appoint appropriate number of judges and clerks and create another polling place so the lines would be shorter and we could get them all to the polling place and get them voted. Well, because of that, as you might expect, I had a wonderful working relationship and a lot of great friends uh, in the African American community throughout the state, but particularly in uh, Pulaski County. And uh, so, uh, 
I think in that first election, you can go back and look at the numbers, but I, I think I got something like 40% of the vote in the community. And I did every election that I ran. Uh, and it was not that, I mean, I was a leader on the Martin Luther King holiday, and I always voted for any bill, the voting rights bills to renew those. I always voted for those. I always voted for civil rights uh, legislation. I always did that, and I worked hard in the uh, community to keep my ties up. Uh, but they understood that I was hardcore on economics. They understood that, and that's okay uh, with them. And so uh, I always ha enjoyed a good vote from there. For a candidate, Skip, to win in this district, a Republican candidate is going to have to figure out how to uh, gain trust uh, and to relate to uh, the African-American community or he can shut his campaign down now. Uh, and the only way to overcome that and to, to overcome it would be to run extremely strongly uh, in the outlying counties in the 2nd Congressional District. And I, I say this without regard or identity of who, who's running for what. I'm not that involved here. I live elsewhere now most of the time. So you all care better to handicap the personnel in that race. But that's my take on it. And that's how I got elected. First Republican and the last. <laughs> and in fairness to him, he was a heck of a campaigner too. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Ed Bethune.